So it is my pleasure yeah. to introduce the first uh, event of our highly successful seminar series organized by the Department of Development Studies and particularly by my colleagues Haben and Naomi who've been doing a, a fantastic job since last year in, in reviving this seminar series and bringing uh, uh, fantastic uh, guest speakers. Um, this seminar series is designed to touch on some big questions. I mean, that is one of the remains of, of what we do. Um, it is also designed to um, contribute with book launches uh, for selected books that we think are going to uh, make some kind of a difference in our field. Um, so it's a real pleasure and, and, and a privilege to introduce today's event, where we have our colleague Ilias Alami, who comes from um, the Center of Development Studies at the University of Cambridge, which is the Department of Politics and International Studies. Um, we have had a long-standing relationship with the Center of Development Studies. Many uh, of our friends who work there, like uh, Justin, um, but also people who came over from uh, to join us in, in at SOAS, like Hachung Chang. Um, Ilias has been there since January, I understand, um, and he is assistant professor in the political economy of uh, development. So prior to joining Cambridge, he was uh, researching and teaching at Uppsala University, Maastricht University, and he had his PhD in University of Manchester in the politics department. Yeah. He has also held his positions in a number of institutions uh, in the Global South, like uh, the Julio Vargas Foundation in São Paulo and University of Johannesburg, and the well-known Sciences Po in Paris. And he is the author of Money, Power, Financial Capital, Emerging Markets, Facing the Liquidity Tsunami, and the book that we are presenting, that he's presenting uh, here, The Spectre of State Capitalism. Uh, as you can imagine, this is a big topic. Uh, there's a lot of debate going on about the rise of so-called state capitalism. Um, and there are all kinds of question marks over the use of this particular term and concept. And I believe that one of the important tasks of this book is precisely to help us navigate that uh, debate about what state capitalism, capitalism means and whether it is, it is a useful concept uh, or not. Um, I did have the chance of actually before we knew we were going to write Ilias, um, uh, thanks to Inter or X of the college now, I did see the announcement of this book coming up and I said, wow, but I need to check that out. <laughs> and to my uh, great surprise and um, pleasant surprise, I found that it was uh, accessible. It was open access. This is not quite common. I mean, this is the kind of book that would go for like hundred pounds yeah. in the bookshops. <laughs> the kind of book that you wait for the library to get so that you can read so uh, i was really um really pleased to to see that there was a link you know a download link to the book and that's what i did so i've got my pdf and uh, i did start reading uh, the book but as you know heads of department are heads of department are not allowed to read <laughs> apart from the hundreds of emails that we get into our inbox uh, so this is the sort of uh, evening activity that every now and then I can indulge myself in, you know, reading either of this book. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm not going to talk about the book uh, because he's here to talk about it, but I think it raises very important questions about the reconfiguration of global capitalism. This is not just a book, I think, about state not enterprises. It is not only a book about, you know, China, the rise of China, or the rise of state capital in some emerging markets in the BRICS. It is far more than that because it situates um, a number of phenomena, a number of developments that are going on, partly related to state capital, but also partly related to the role of the state in global capitalism. And it also links them to questions of financialization and other key trends, mega trends uh, in global capitalism. And I think that is probably one of the big um, uh, selling points uh, of this book, um, that it really covers such uh, an incredible um, um, ground uh, that is going to be um, a must read for anyone interested interested in mega trends in global capitalism now. So, without further ado, I'm going to uh, hand over to Ilias, and so I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Uh, 
thank you so much, Carlos, for the very generous introduction. I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, this is a book that we have spent a lot of time researching and writing. Uh, so it's great to be at this stage where I get to present the book and discuss the book, and I can't think of a better place uh, to do that here at SOAS. Okay, so um, yes, the book is open access and free to download. So, you know, you should read it. It's free. Why not? <laughs> But you can also pay 105,000 if you want, but <laughs> you don't have to do that. Uh, oops, let me see. Yes. Okay, I should also say that this is a co-authored book uh, with my colleague and good friend, uh, Professor Adam Dixon, who's at uh, Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh. I was actually just there earlier this week to do another book launch. And yes, let me jump right into it. I'm going to give you an overview of the book and some of the key questions that we try and answer in this book. So let me start with a simple definition. Uh, as Carlos said, the term state capitalism is quite contested. It has a very long history, um, uh, which is, you know, it's been used by people like Lenin in the late 19th century. It's been used by um, scholars in the, in, in the Frankfurt Critical uh, School of Critical Theory in the interwar period. It's been used by scholars of uh, post-war developmentalism and so on and so forth. And it's been used to refer to the Soviet Union, it's been used to refer to China, et cetera, et cetera. So a contested term, which has a long history, it's been used to, to refer to many different political systems and political economies. So it's important to start with the basic definition here. State capitalism can be simply defined as a capitalist social formation, whereby the state plays a particularly strong role in the economy. As, a, as you can already see, this is a simple definition, but all, already sort of problematic in the sense that what is a strong role? You know, there's you know, how to define what even uh, strength is in this case. Uh, but let me elaborate a little bit on that. The first thing we can say is that this often refers to a social formation where the state often directly assumes the role of capitalists, which means that it owns or controls assets and means of production and that it accumulates capital for it, um, on its own. Or this could be also about the state directly creating and shaping capitalist markets. This phenomenon, interestingly, <clears throat> has historically manifested in a great variety of shapes and forms. You could argue that this phenomenon is as old as global capitalism itself. Um, you, know, you could argue that global capitalism as a mode of production emerged in the long 16th century, and that since then, we've witnessed or we've seen various forms of state capitalism. I'll give you a few examples. Imperial chartered companies, government economic planning agencies, war production boards, uh, public utilities, national and, uh, oil and gas companies, policy banks, state-owned investment funds, and many, many others. So again, it's a phenomenon that has taken great diversity of shapes and forms. So the question then is why use this term now um, and you know, what, what does it refer to? So we can start by looking at the business or the financial press, especially in the West. If you, if you read you know, Bloomberg, Reuters, um, the Financial Times, The Economist, this is, this is what you see. And this is how those people use the term state capitalism. Often this is to refer to uh, what is allegedly a new variety of capitalism that is state-led, and that would be purportedly uh, coming from emerging markets. China, but also Brazil, Russia, Turkey, maybe Indonesia, uh, sometimes Hungary, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is that what we've seen over the past perhaps 20 to 30 years is the emergence and the rise of this different version of capitalism than the one that prevails in the West. Um, of course, the assumption here is that in the West, you know, capitalism is more uh, characterized by free markets and, and liberalism and, and democracy and that kind of stuff. Whereas this version of capitalism is sort of different. It's state-led and often it's, it's argued that it's also sort of authoritarian or at least autocratic. And the argument that you see often is that this new version of capitalism is actually creating a lot of problems globally, politically but also economically. So it's very common for you know pundits and liberal commentators to argue that this new state capitalism, again, coming from the East, the South, China, and so on, is fracturing the global economic consensus, um, as a, an FT journalist put it. 
and that it's also you know it's upending the liberal international order it's distorting markets it's um, sort of messing with the price system and so on and so forth. in other words it's a threat to the global economy and to you know even West western democracies and, and so on so that's the, the sort of main usage of the term that you can see at the moment in the business press if you look at policy making circles so if you look at what uh, policymakers and state leaders, especially in the West, again, how they use the term, there is, this is somehow similar. So just to illustrate this point, here's a quote uh, of, by U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. He says, we should insist on competing in a rules-based system that protects our people from the aggressive state capitalism of modern autocracies. But of course, here's, he's specifically talking about uh, China and Russia. This is from the Trade Policy Review of the European Commission, which is the strategic document which is supposed to outline the uh, sort of trade policy orientation of the EU for the next five to 10 years. So a very important document. And the report argues that the rapid rise of China, demonstrating global ambitions and pursuing a distinct state capitalist model has fundamentally changed the global economic and political order. So again, you see here this notion that state capitalism is this sort of nasty version of capitalism coming from the East and South and, you know, is sort of rising and threatening existing um, power balances, et cetera, et cetera. Now, for some academics as well, state capitalism is something that comes from those countries, that is in the, in the East and South, broadly speaking. Uh, the first book on, on, the, on your left here is actually not an academic book. It's uh, It's been written by Ian Bremer, who's a sort of liberal pundit, he's the, the CEO of the Eurasia Group, which is a big consultancy firm, or sort of think tanky organization as well. And he argues that this rise of state capitalism is, is signaling the end of the free market unless the West uh, reacts to that. And the other three, and so, so the one in the middle um, on the right by Joshua Kurlansik is also not quite an academic book, uh, although it's been published by University Press, Oxford University Press. This is a slightly more nuanced argument, but overall, it's also about the rise of this new variant of capitalism, which is creating all sorts of problems. And although he acknowledges that some state capitalism can also be observed in the West, the, the problematic version of it mostly comes from the South and the East. Uh, and then you have more sophisticated versions of this argument, much more interesting, of course, much more critical uh, in the work of uh, Andreas Nolke and colleagues on the far uh, on the right there, not the far right. Um, state per permeated capitalism in large emerging economies. So this is an argument very much framed in the varieties of capitalism traditions, so comparative political economy. And their argument is indeed that, you know, globally speaking, you've got liberal market economies as one version of capitalism, variant of capitalism, dominating especially in um, the US and maybe the UK. So those sort of Anglo-Saxon economies. You have coordinated market economies in Japan, and uh, you know uh, Western Europe, and now again another version of capitalism that they call st state permeated capitalism that comes from large emerging economies. So of course, to them, because they come from a critical uh, tradition, the problem of that is that is not that it's threatening the world order or anything like that. They actually argue that it's an interesting alternative to neoliberalism. But nonetheless, there is still the idea that this state capitalism comes from the, the East and it's distinct. It's distinctively different from the more ordinary uh, version of capitalism that is more free market oriented, et cetera, et cetera, and which prevail in the West. Now, uh, what I won't argue and what we do argue in the book is that in fact, far from being limited to emerging economies, contemporary, global, sorry, contemporary state capitalism is a global phenomenon. In fact, we argue that it's a phenomenon which is of all historic significance. It has to be grasped on a planetary scale. So it's not only limited to emerging economies at all. And I'll give you a few empirical data points to illustrate that. Um, and I do want to spend a bit of time on this because it, it, this is essentially about the empirical facts that the book tries to explain. So let me, let me lay out some of those uh, empirical facts. facts. As of 2024, there were 179 sovereign wealth funds, which are simply put uh, pools of money, which are state owned or state controlled, and which are invested in financial markets. And this is a more than six fold increase since 20 years before. 
They control assets worth $12.4 trillion. So we're talking about huge sums of money here. Uh, this is from the from the Financial Times from a couple of years, uh, sorry, a couple of weeks ago, um, which sort of documents this expansion of sovereign wealth funds and the assets that they have under management over the past 20 years. So as I said, big money here, this is more than hedge funds and private equity firms combined. Now, as many of you will expect, the largest of those funds are located in uh, Middle Eastern economies exporting oil and gas, or in East Asia, especially very, very large Chinese funds, uh, and Singapore also, which has a couple of very large funds. But in fact, and of course the Norwegian fund is the largest in the world by quite some margin. But in fact, this, this rise of sovereign wealth funds is a global story. Just give you a few examples here uh, of sovereign wealth funds. There's one, IFMA Capital is from Mor Morocco, Fonsis is from Senegal, there's one in Egypt, uh, Nigeria, Angola, Kazakhstan, Malaysia, France, Italy, Ireland, Indonesia. You may have heard about the Biden administration just last week, uh, brainstorming about launching a sovereign wealth fund. You may have heard about the UK, um, plan to launch a sovereign wealth fund. You may have heard about the European Commission, uh, trying to sort of set up a European sovereignty, sovereign wealth fund, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a global story. So at the same time as we've seen the rise of sovereign wealth funds, we've also seen the, rise, the revival of state-owned enterprises. Over the past decades, they've doubled in importance amongst the world's 2,000th largest firms. At $45 trillion, their assets are now equivalent to half the global GDP, according to the IMF. So again, huge sums of money. And you know, you may those enterprises, state enterprises, are now present in a wide range of sectors. So you may expect to find them in, you know, in in uh, public utilities and natural resources, which is indeed true. But they are also active in engineering and construction, heavy industry, advanced manufacturing, and so on. Interestingly, a lot of those state enterprises have become much like transnational corporations. They operate across borders. Um, and again, the story is global. So yes, there are, there's many you know, Chinese state enterprises, many state enterprises in Singapore and elsewhere, but also, as you can see on this chart, which is again from the IMF or this map, there's many of them in Europe. And in fact, the story is global as well, with sort of less emphasis in, in the Americas. But nonetheless, the point is that this story is again global. So we've got the rise of sovereign wealth funds, the rise of state enterprises back into fashion. We also have national development and policy banks which have uh, been, uh, which have experienced this sort of revival as well. They've vastly expanded their loan portfolio and financial firepower uh, in both the global north and the global south over the past 20 years. According to recent, recent estimates, there's more than 900 worldwide controlling assets worth $49 trillion. And again, this is a global story. So this, this is a bit old, um, this, this chart from the OECD. But as you can see, this is across countries in, in any sort of income category and across all continents. Here's a couple of interesting books uh, on that topic if you'd like to read more, including one of your former colleagues here, uh, Tom uh, Marwan. Okay, we've also seen at the same, over the same period of time a proliferation or a profusion of techno-industrial policies and national development strategies, again both in the global north and the global south. In the global north, and especially in technologically advanced economies, those new forms of industrial policies often aim to develop sectors like advanced semiconductors, AI, cloud computing, 5G, and so on, as well as the green, you know, clean tech, renewables, etc. In the global south, we've also seen the emergence of new forms, excuse me, of develop of development strategies which uh, which aim which are based on the use of large-scale connected infrastructure to insert territories and firms in the value chains, but also to develop sectors like critical transition minerals, green energy, and so on. According to UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, the rate of adoption of industrial policies is at an all-time high, which is quite remarkable. Uh, here's an interestingly titled paper from the IMF. Uh, this, is, this is named The Return of the Policy That Shall Not Be Named, Principles of Industrial Policy, just from a couple of years ago. Um, and this is another working paper from the IMF, which tracks interest in the, in the business press um, or mentions of industrial policy in the major business press, which is also a sort of sign 
that you know industrial policy is, is back um, back in fashion is, is in the air of times. And as you can very clearly see, there's a, a, a very evident upward trend. And finally, we've also seen a multiplication of trade and investment restrictions. So here on the left hand side, you can see that you know the, the flows that constitute globalization, flows of finance, trade, and services, those have not reversed. They've sort of plateaued over the past 10 years, plateaus importantly, but at the same time, there's been a very rapid increase in trade and investment restrictions. And that includes things like expert controls, bad and foreign technologies, foreign investment screening mechanisms, which is about governments using legal powers to screen investments coming in and deciding to block or not that investment, capital controls, trade tariffs, sanctions, etc. So a very remarkable increase uh, about those policies to the point that the IMF is talking now about the risks of geoeconomic fragmentation. Okay, so all of those are the empirical facts that we try and explain in the book. Um, and this, this is essentially what we mean by the new state capitalism. We refer to this as the expansion of the state's role as promoter of capital accumulation, which is what all states do in capitalism, but also as investor share shareholders and as direct owners of capital and assets. Now, again, to, to really drive this point home, this is a global phenomenon. And it manifests in two ways in particular. On the one hand, the multiplication of state-owned corporate entities, such as the ones that I just mentioned, sovereign wealth funds, state enterprises, and policy and development banks. And the other leg, if you will, is what we call in the book, the development of muscular forms of statism, which is about states direct, directly intervening in the circuits of capital. And in particular, we look at three uh, forms of that, including those that I just mentioned. So techno-industrial policies, national development strategies, and trade and investment restrictions. So really the questions, yes, and I should say that what is it, what's interesting, of course, is that there's been a combined expansion of those two things. So the, the, those are the questions that we want to answer in the book. Why is this happening? How to explain this phenomenon? And what are its implications? So in the time that I have left, uh, which is about um, maybe 20 minutes, a little less than that. No, 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes. I'm going to sketch a couple of the arguments that we make to answer those questions. Not all the arguments, it's a very dense book, many chapters, many different topics, but I'm just going to try and sketch some of the key arguments to you know, uh, spark your interest and encourage you to read the book. So, the first important argument I think that we make in the book is that there's at least six sets of interrelated, interrelated factors which pertain to the historical development of global capitalism since the turn of the millennium, so over the past two decades, which are important to understand the rise of this new state capitalism. And, uh, and here you can see sort of list of those factors, geographic, financial, corporate, geopolitical, economic, and technological factors. And I'm going to say a few words about each of those. It's too hot in here. <laughs> I wanted to wear my nice jacket, but... Uh... <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So let me start with technological factors. Now, this is a bit of a truism, and I'm sure all of you will know that, but as you know, capitalism as, a, as an economic system is driven by a compulsion, uh, which itself is fueled by competition between firms to increase labor productivity via technological change. And the reason for that, for that is that the firms which control more advanced technologies can then generate superior profits than their competitors. So this makes capitalism quite a dynamic, technologically speaking, uh, system with a very fast moving frontier of technological innovation. Now, the reason this is important is that as of late, many of those technological innovations can be characterized as general purpose technologies. So things like advanced semiconductors, nanotech, AI, advanced materials, quantum computing, et cetera, et cetera. Those things <clears throat> can be characterized as general purpose technologies, which means that um, they can be used in a very wide range of production methods and systems, a very wide range of uh, production processes, labor processes, and so on and so forth. 
which means that they have the, pot the potential to impact entire economies. So this makes them very strategic for both states and firms alike. And the reason this is important here for the story of new state capitalism is that states have then have realized that uh, and have tried to develop new forms of techno-industrial policies to coordinate the emergence of tech frontiers, especially in those sectors. So here I'm talking mostly about advanced capitalist states in the West and in East Asia. Um, and, and they've also re-mobilized state ownership to do so. So you know, sovereign wealth funds and policy banks have been used to strategically invest uh, in those sectors or to offer low cost, so-called low cost finance or, or patient capital as we often call it, to support small firms and national champions to help them develop or acquire strategic capabilities in these sectors. Again, recognizing that those are absolutely key. And if you lose competition in those sectors, you're probably going to lose out in many, many others. States have also uh, taken equity stakes in key firms. So they've injected state property in key firms as a means to often retain control or to acquire control of key nodes in strategic supply chains. So Japan, for instance, has just um, created a fund that is a state-owned fund, which is under the umbrella of the Ministry of Trade and Industry. And that fund has taken participations, so equity stakes, in two or three key firms in the semiconductor sector in Japan, recognizing that the Japanese state needs to keep control of some of the key firms which are inserted um, as uh, key nodes in strategic supply chains. And states have also redeployed investment restrictions and trade defensive measures to protect critical firms, assets, intellectual property, and or to control the flow of tech capital and talent. So a good example of that is, of course, the US, which is doing all the US state, which is doing a lot to prevent China from developing advanced um, capabilities in, this, in the advanced semiconductor sector. So it's even forbidding its own citizens. American citizens cannot work for a company that is involved in some way or another in the semiconductor um, sector in China or associated with China. So technological factors are quite important in the sense that they have pushed states to intervene more, including by remobilizing state ownership. So that's the first factor, set of factors. The second one is the geographic factors that I mentioned earlier. So that refers more specifically to the geographic rebalancing of the world economy. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that you know capitalism arguably was born in the long 16th century. If you think about most of the history of capitalism, its center of gravity was in the North Atlantic or around the North Atlantic. And what we've seen over the past 20 years is a shift, a very secular world historic shift from the North Atlantic to the Pacific Rim. Now, this is, this is very significant in terms of global patterns of uneven development, but also, as I'll argue in a moment, this, this shift has required very large scale state intervention um, to facilitate it. So and this sort of relates to the technological development that I just mentioned, but progress in terms of automation, digitalization, have allowed firms to reorganize labor processes, supply chains and logistical networks in ways that maximize exploitation across territorial, territorial borders. I'm sure you'll be largely familiar with this story. This is the story of, of global value chains, you know, um, globally speaking. Now those global value chains often connect frontiers of natural resource extraction, largely in Latin America, Africa, and Central Asia, to spaces of labor-intensive manufacturing, predominantly in East Asia and Southeast Asia, but also pockets of industrialization in Central and Eastern Europe, as well as in Northern Mexico. And those spaces are in turn connected to spaces of consumption, consumption in urban agglomerations in advanced capitalist economies. Now, again, this sort of new pattern of global uneven development has required large-scale intervention um, in the form of planning and territorial development agencies. So those you know, have a long history in capitalism, but they've been remobilized um, yeah. to over the past couple of decades. And states have also, and, and so large-scale state-led investments often conducted by state enterprises, sovereign wealth funds, and development banks have also been targeted to energy grids, digital networks, transportation infrastructure, and integrated systems of logistical connectivity. So in other words, all the material infrastructure which can facilitate the flow of commodities, people, information, investment, capital, and so on and so forth um, 
to, to, to mediate this new global pattern of uneven development. So those are the geographic factors. Now, I'm moving to the third set of factors, which are more economic. And, and those are, of course, related to both the technological factors and the geographic factors. And those relate to intensified economic competition as well as economic stagnation. So the story here is that technological development and the geographic rebalancing of the global economy and the formation of global value chains, all of that has immensely increased productive capacities worldwide. This, of course, has, you know, it, it made a lot of money to, <laughs> to quite a few people, but at the same time, it's worsened the tendencies which are inbuilt in capitalism, which is that it often enters periods of overproduction and capital overaccumulation. So this new cycle of accumulated, this new pattern of global and even development has worsened uh, overproduction and overaccumulation. It's led to, situ to situations of industrial overcapacity in manufacturing sectors and saturation in several global industrial product markets, including things like agro and petrochemicals, aluminum, steel, or steel making, I should say, shipbuilding, coal power, but also things like more advanced sectors like solar panels, EV batteries, and semiconductors. Now, this is something that mainstream economists refer to as secular stagnation, which is the idea that capitalism has entered a period of low manufacturing output growth, low labor productivity gains, and the slowing pace of investment, and just generally speaking, low rates of growth. Um, yeah, so here's a sort of important book on the topic from a mainstream perspective, mainstream economic perspective. But the reason this is important for state capitalism is that this process has intensified competition between industrial firms. And what firms and you know experience as intensified competition, states end up experiencing as intensified geopolitical or geoeconomic competition as well. And so states have been increasingly active in supporting the, their firms as they engage in this tougher competition. They've deployed industrial policies as well as mobilized policy banks to help their firms compete internationally. And as they have done so, this is quite interesting, they've also, also engaged in dynamics of competitive emulation, which means that states sort of copy each other a bit as they do that. So for instance, you know, you may have heard of uh, China's Made in, what is it? Made in uh, China 2025, which is a broad industrial policy plan for uh, which China has launched a couple of years ago to boost its economy and especially to develop the more advanced sectors, uh, technologically speaking. And it designed this plan by looking at how Germany has done industrial policy in the past. Now, as the US, uh, as China has launched this plan, this has triggered a very aggressive response on the part of the US, which has launched its own industrial policy plans, the US Science and Chips Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, and other in, um, industrial policy programs, which are aimed specifically at emulating a bit what China does and competing with China. This in turn has pushed the EU to react and launch its own program of industrial policies, which then has pushed Japan, South Korea, and others to launch their own programs. So you can see how competitive emulation contributes to the proliferation of this new state capitalism. And states have also used more and more trade and investment restrictions to protect key firms and markets from foreign competition, which can lead also to tit for tat retaliations, things about trade wars, when a state would put trade restrictions to sort of penalize a competitor, and this competitor would then retaliate with a, a countervailing measure, which might spark another response, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that you can have an escalation, which also contributes to the, we talk, the types of transformation uh, that I've discussed earlier. And sovereign law funds have also been remobilized to facilitate the flow of capital from sectors particularly affected by stagnation. So the, fact, the sectors which are the least dynamic uh, and to move some of the capital from those sectors to the more uh, dynamic ones. So again, simply put, the argument here is that as it's tougher and tougher for firms to compete and to acquire new market shares, states have been more committed to support them and they have reinvented their roles um, in the process. Now, all this has, you know, has happened at the same time as geopolitics have worsened, and this has also sort of fueled a worsening of geopolitics. So geopolitical factors are also very important to understand the rise of this new state capitalism. 
Uh, we've seen a new multipolarity of power and economic activity in the world economy. This is partly a result of the geographic economic transformations that I talked about earlier. We've also seen a sort of hardening of geopolitics with changing relationships between Western capitalist economies, China and Russia, uh, but also many regional powers such as Hungary, India, Turkey, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, and so on. And a growing geoeconomic rivalry in the realms of international trade, investments, and technological leadership. So again, this is this is sort of the political or the geopolitical aspect of the economic competition that I talked about earlier between firms. States have also aggressively or developed aggressive rhetorics which portray foreign competitors as threats, not only economically speaking, but also as threats to the sovereignty, autonomy, and integrity of the nation. And we've seen a general turn towards more assertive forms of economic nationalism, which collapse the distinction between economic interest and national security. Um, and you know, all of that is key to state capitalism insofar as states have remobilized sovereign wealth funds and state enterprises to strengthen control over strategic sector, critical resources, and key infrastructure. And they've used policy measure, measures such as tariffs, bans on foreign technologies, green protectionism to penalize foreign competitors. So again, all of this to say that geopolitics have also fueled the rise of this so-called new state capitalism. Okay, this is the penultimate set of factors, financial factors. Um, more precisely, financial dislocations and instabilities. I think this is the argument you might be the most familiar with here, which is that financial crises have pushed states to intervene more. I'll just lay it out quickly for you. With the development of the world economy, as I just explained, this has also been accompanied by the formation of a very sophisticated global financial system and the vast expansions of expansion of financial flows, many of which are highly volatile and speculative, which of course triggers instabilities for, for countries especially states in the global East and South, which are particularly exposed to financial vulnerability. Uh, so some, some colleagues and I have been trying to, to offer the concept of international financial subordination to make sense of that. But the point here is broader. Even advanced capitalist economies, which are the core of the financial system, have experienced difficulties maintaining financial stability because shocks quickly reverberate through the financial system and spread to the world economy. So even the US, you know, which arguably is at the core of the financial system, which has the U it has the US dollar, which is at the core of the monetary system, and still it's experienced a lot of problems in terms of financial stability and has struggled to maintain, to maintain it. So this has pushed states to intervene more. Um, in response to financial crises, you can of course, of course think about the 2008 global financial crisis, but COVID-19, the pandemic itself has created the financial shock, which has reverberated through the financial system and spread to the world economy. Uh, and so this has pushed states to intervene more, in, uh, both in the form of direct intervention and state ownership. So think about a bailout, for instance. Often that has involved states ac actually taking participation or, um, yeah, or injecting equity into private companies, which means that state property has been injected. Now, not all states have made use of that property, but at least um, the, the end result is that state ownership has increased as a result of those state interventions. You can also think about sovereign, sorry, about central banks, which arguably have become even more pivotal than ever uh, for the reproduction of global capitalism. They vastly expanded their balance sheets and have, you know, very um, their role in, in sort of trying and maintain the modicum of financial stability has been absolutely key for global capitalism. Sovereign wealth funds have been, have been also used by a range of countries from Russia to Saudi Arabia to um, countries in West in Africa to buffer the economy from external macrofinancial shocks. So it's basically the idea that you can use a pool of money to try and, and protect your economy from external shocks. They've also used policy banks to extend credit in a counter-cyclical way um, when there's a private credit crunch and or to renationalize banking sectors. So, you know, countries like Brazil, Bolivia, and others have used uh, state-owned banks as a means to, to extend state control over the financial system and the banking system in particular. And many countries in the world have also uh, redeployed diverse forms of capital controls, which are controls on the inflow and outflow of uh, private finance. 
to try and tame the more speculative of those flows and to restore some financial stability. Oh yes, and my my first book uh, was was about those those things. So if you're interested in that, you can have a look at that. It's not open access, but someone put it on Libgen for free, so you can just. <laughs> 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 I'm glad someone did. I, I couldn't figure out how to do it myself. Actually, so. um, okay, so um, this is the final set of factors that I want to discuss, and then I'll, I'll wrap up, which are corporate factors. So it's also important to understand how firms, and especially private firms, have behaved over the past 20 years to understand why states have intervened more. And so in the book, we look in particular at four business strategies that have emerged over this period and which are quite interesting to understand why states have intervened more. The first one, and you'll be largely familiar with that, it's that states, sorry, firms, especially transnational mm -hmm. corporations, the more powerful ones, have relied on financial markets and instruments to enhance organizational power. That's a bit jargonistic, but that means that, you know, firms, uh, global transnational corporations, as a means to secure control over supply chains and to, to organize sort of supply chains in the way that, that fits their own interests, have been able to leverage private finance and access to the private financial system as a means to push cost disciplines to other actors in those supply chains, subcontractors and, and, and others. Um, and of course, the other aspect of that is, so this is quite well documented in the literature on global production networks and global value chains. Uh, but it's but the flip side of that is that of course those firms have relied more and more on, on the financial system as a means to also um, generate revenues, which has triggered all sorts of financial instabilities, including the ones that I just mentioned earlier. And this is something that you may have heard of in the context of the literature on financialization. Um, so, so this sort of corporate business strategies. Um, is very important or so very <laughs> important to understand why states intervene more. The second one is oops. The second one is the turn to logistics as a site of value creation and as a source of competitive edge. So this really um, is about supply chain capitalism, is about firms developing very sophisticated supply chains, um, you know, incorporating logistics calculations into production flows the management of entire supply chains as an integrated total cost system, the development of just-in-time production networks, um, and other innovations in the logistical systems. And the point here is that, you know, as it becomes harder and harder to produce more commodities and to sell those commodities, just uh, by competing with, with, uh, with rival firms, you start trying and manage the circulation of capital as a means to, gen to generate more cash. So this, this too, as you might expect, has required much investment in infrastructure to facilitate and to accelerate the movement of commodities, to accelerate the turnover time of capital. Um, and, uh, and this has been the factor which has pushed states to intervene more. The third business strategy which large firms have relied on is the turn to so-called rentier, rentier strategies based on the monopoly control of intangibles as a source of market power. So you know, it's become more and more important for firms to uh, develop or to monopolize control over things like trademarks and patents um, and other forms of intellectual property rights as a source of market power, but also as a source of um, revenue generation. So extracting rents from the control of those intangible assets. Now here too, and, and this is, you know, when you think about the largest digital platform economies, uh, companies, this is very much their strategy. Um, now here too, states have been implicated in supporting those strategies insofar as they have helped, as I argued earlier, firms develop strategic capabilities in those, in the sectors where you, you find those, inter these, those intangibles and have developed you know, tougher intellectual property laws to help firms monopolize those technologies for longer periods of time. I'm, I'm, I'm aware that I'm going a, a bit fast here, but I guess what I would like you to, to, to take from that is that all of those corporate strategies have required massive state intervention. And finally, the fourth strategy is that state, uh, 
firms have relied more and more on mergers and acquisitions as well as stakeholders to shore up profits. So you know, as, as competition becomes tougher and tougher, as it becomes harder to maintain profit rates by producing more and selling your commodities and selling them cheaper than your competitors, you start actually buying your competitor out um, as a means to secure market power and to maintain profit rates. So firms have been buying each other out. This is very well documented. And in Marxist terms, you call this the concentration of capital. So it's, it's about property rights changing. And uh, basically, more and more capital becomes co concentrated or centralized, rather, into fewer hands. Now, here, too, states have been very directly involved in that. But again, the whole the, the main point is that enhanced state inter intervention uh, um, has been required to support all of those corporate strategies. And again, in, in, in the book, I'm not going to say more on that, but in the book, we look at a very wide range of sectors and geographies to, to illustrate this argument. Okay, before I conclude, a quick recap. Uh, what I've argued so far is that the structural determinants of this rise of the new state capitalism um, are related to the historical development of global capitalism, and in particular, those six factors. And it's these factors combined which have compelled states to reinvent and to expand their roles as promoter of capital accumulation, as industrial policy actors, as investor shareholders, and as direct owners of capital and assets. Now, I just want to say a few words about, uh, and this is also how we conclude the book, we, we sort of reflect a bit about the question of climate change and, and you know, the necessity for decarbonization and how those things might impact on this new state capitalism. And the argument we make here is quite simple. It's basically that climate change will bear upon all six factors that I talked about. The corporate, the geopolitical, the geographic, the economic, etc., uh, etc. Et climate change will increase their salience even more. And so we, we may very well expect more state capitalism in the near future. I'll just give you a few pointers to, to illustrate this point. High-tech competition um, has already become a climate issue. We've seen a green subsidies race for electric vehicle, renewable energy, and clean tech unfolding over the past couple of years. Um, <clears throat> if you read the Financial Times, every day there's something about that. So we can expect more green techno industrial policies in the future as the climate crisis worsens. We can also expect climate change to disrupt global value chains, which will require significant state intervention likely in the form of state investment in infrastructure and territorial planning. So, you know, as a means to, to try and either protect some of those value chains or to reconfigure them in the face of climate change. So this too is going to, to sort of push for more state capitalism, if you will. We've also already seen a convergence of climate and national security imperatives, especially in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, this is already well underway and it's catalyzing renewed state interventionism. You can see some of that when you look at competition in sectors like uh, critical transition minerals, as well as um, other energy sources like green hydrogen, for instance. <clears throat> Climate change, we know, um, is going to trigger financial instabilities, which again is likely to push states to intervene, to compensate or to mitigate that. So overall, it's likely that we'll see a deepening state capitalism in an age of catastrophic climate heating and environmental breakdown. It's a bit dramatic, but <laughs> uh, you get the, the idea. So what, you know, what is to be done? And we conclude the book with uh, some reflections, arguably you know, quite tentative and um, yeah, quite tentative, but we do want to reflect a bit on, on what kind of moment that offers for progressive politics. And of course, the, the, the starting point is that the question is not if, but how this state capitalism is going to shape our near future. So we try to reflect a bit on what kind of strategies for progressive forces can be adopt adopted. The first, yeah, and we argue that there's at least openings for two types of strategies of political engagement with and against a state. The first one is a broadly, you could say, reformist strategy, and we, we call it democratizing and greening state capitalism. Um, this is simply the idea that, you know, states are already doing all sorts of things. So can we find strategies to push states to do those things in a way that 
doesn't distract us as fast as <laughs> it's doing at the moment. So, you know, it's clear that states can and indeed must do more for us, notably in terms of addressing inequalities and leading decarbonization transitions. So, for instance, you know, we know that states are capable of mobilizing, you know, very powerful. Uh, I was going to say powerful powers, but are, <laughs> are going to, you know, are capable of very powerfully intervening to to try and penalize a competitor or to or to sanction a foreign firm or you know those kind of things. Like, why not try and use those coercive powers for something that is more empowering to people? So the point here is to try and push states to use their newfound <coughs> or rather rediscovered capacities and resources, uh, and to push them to use them in to push states to use them in directions that are less socially and environmentally destructive. You could envisage scenarios where green state ownership and green industrial policy is used together um, with strategies of broad-based economic democratization as a means to you know, try to empower communities and uh, progressive forces. And this, you know, green state ownership could be used to coordinate a massive push to invest in low carbon production systems, green mobilities, ecosystems re restoration, public services, et cetera, et cetera. And climate justice, of course. So this, this is the, a broad strategy that, that is reformist and that we call democratizing and green state capitalism. I'll leave you, you know, to determine if you think this is reasonable or not, but at least this is, we argue that there's a moment, there's an opening for this kind of, of thinking. Mm. The second type of strategy is more transformative or dare I say it, revolutionary. And this is, is a bit different. We call it towards democratic planning and alternative forms of ownership. <clears throat> and this is, you know, is a bit different from the previous one. The previous one is like the state capitalism is doing all of those things, so we could perhaps harness some of that for progressive ends. This is a bit different. This one is about state capitalism revealing something about our economies and pushing us to perhaps explore what it reveals. And more precisely, this new state capitalism reveals fault lines and cracks in capitalist society, especially because it inadvertently contributes to repoliticizing the economy. So you may know that capitalism as, an, as a mode of production is sort of predicated um, on a neat separation that is constantly enforced of the economy from the political. And state capitalism via state ownership, via muscular forms of state interventionism is collapsing this separation. That creates a sort of political opportunity in the sense that people are forced to think about the nature of the economy. More precisely that the capitalist economy, so things like the market, competition, prices, appears in plain sight for what it is, which is a social construct that is fundamentally underpinned by political power and public authority. So there's nothing natural about it, which means that it can be organized differently. It also engages us to think more about the question of property. Uh, more precisely, social relations with property are not natural or eternal, and the very power to allocate social resources can be organized differently. Yeah. Uh, so all of this to say that, you know, the, the sort of cracks that we see in capitalist society through state capitalism is the, is the potential for radical democratic experiments with planning and alternative forms of public ownership. So neither state nor private, but alternative ones that are yet to be designed and experimented with, uh, through which communities could own and manage the wealth they produce in ways that balance goals of efficiency, justice, democracy, and equality. And perhaps this is a way to reclaim power and control over our collective future. Thanks very much. I leave it there and I very, I hope this is, uh, you know, sort of prompting your interests and you read the book and engage with it. And I very much look forward to any comments or questions you may have. Thank you, Elias. Um, I think you have done a great job in terms of uh, giving us a bit more appetite to read, to read your book. Um, I also think that apart from being incredibly stimulated from uh, a simple academic researcher point of view, many of, of the people in the audience are our new students. Um, and I think, you know, starting the seminar series with this presentation and this book, just basically touching on some of the biggest questions of our time is absolutely spot on. And I'm sure that this is going to give them a little bit more sort of uh, energy to you know, <laughs> embark on the new journey in the master's program or whatever program they're doing uh, with us. Um, you've raised um, 
an incredible amount of you know very big questions, not some of them are quite challenging. Uh, I mean, there's three things that I that I think are really in the book, but also quite reflected in your presentation. One is conceptual clarity, which is quite often uh, not the case in, in big books on some of these big questions. Secondly, um, there is an appetite for careful empirical analysis. Again, something that cannot be assumed. You know, I've, I've read a lot of books on these big questions, which are quite short on empirical facts. Um, and this, this one is clearly not, 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 not such a case. And finally, uh, I think, you know, the, the, the end of your presentation, which is also reflected in the book, which is, this is not all gloom and doom. You know, there's, there's some openings here. And then there's a question of what kind of, you know, more progressive uh, agenda can be developed on the back of, uh, of understanding what's really going on uh, in global capitalism. And this is really not just about state capitalism. It is about uh, global capitalism.